So we're doing 20B today. When I see you again, we'll be talking about 20C because that's what you'll do that week before the midterm. Um, and then we'll go over the, the midterm exam. All right. Okay. So um, experiment 20 part B here. We'll kind of refresh ourselves on where we came from and where, where we are heading. So last week, we did the first step, right? We, you guys all took 4-hydroxybenzoic acid and you reacted it with your alcohol, either methanol, ethanol, or 1-propanol, and you made the first <coughs> ester. So you made some sort of hydroxybenzoate um, compound, some, some benzoate ester, all right? This week, we're going to take those esters um, in the presence of pyridine and with an acid chloride, we're then going to make the second ester. So by the end of this week, you will have a diester compound that we're then going to use for the enzymatic hydrolysis, all right? Um, this week's lab is, there isn't like a long stir time or a long, you know, sitting around waiting time kind of thing. So you'll be taking the quiz before you come to lab this week. Or sorry, before you come to lab. Before you start your experiment this week. Okay, so at the very start of lab, we will give the quiz, just like most regular normal lab periods. Okay, so you will take the quiz at the start of the lab period, then you will start experiment 20B, all right? Um, so this reaction, this alcoholysis reaction, taking your, whatever your 28 product is, all right, and then you're going to react it with whatever acid chloride you were assigned, all right? And so, um, this, remember that, like, yeah, I'm going to just write these there. The meth, so if you're adding a methyl group on for your R group, all right, you're going to use acetyl chloride. So even though this is a two carbon piece, one of those carbons is your carbonyl. So in order to get this piece, that R group, to be a methyl group, we're using acetyl chloride. Does everyone see that? Okay. So then if you're adding an ethyl group on, you're using propanyl chloride. Because you're adding two carbons in your R group and then you have your one carbonyl carbon. And if you're adding a propyl group on, then you're going to use butyl chloride. And so in the end, this R group is going to be a methyl. This R group is going to be an ethyl. This R group is going to be a propyl. reaction. 
So you're not going to use red can ether to set up the reaction. You're going to use the anhydrous ether to set up the reaction. Okay. Um, and then pyridine that we use is really clean, dry pyridine. So make sure to keep it capped. Um, when you take it to your hood, keep it covered. Um, keep things as dry as possible. And then the acid chlorides, I'm going to show you the setup here in a little bit that we're going to use. Um, those we're adding by syringe so that we can A, control how they're being added, but also keep things with those as dry as possible as well. Okay. Um, now the other thing with the acid chlorides is they can be lacrimators. So they can irritate, because they react with moisture, they can react with your own human moisture, right? In your eyes, in your nose, in your mouth, those where, where you have moisture exposed for your body. So um, they can be lacrimators. We need to keep those in the hood, um, keep them <coughs> as contained as possible, um, and make sure that you're always dispensing of them in the hood. Um, the other thing is they all have a smell to them, okay? So like acetyl, that's related to what? Acetic acid, right? So it's going to smell similar to vinegar. Propionyl chloride has its own, it smells, propionic acid isn't as common for you to know what that smells like, but it has its own stench to it. Um, and butyl chloride smells like butyric acid. Well, butyric acid is what, um, if you've ever smelled rancid butter, it's what makes it stink. That's, that's the part that makes it stink. So it smells really bad, okay? So we're going to make sure we keep everything in the hood. Um, any garbage that we have that's stinky, we don't want to throw out in the garbage that's out in the hoods. We're going to keep it in garbage bags that are in hoods, not throw it outside of the hood. Um, and what we're going to talk about here in a little bit, some precautions we're going to take with the butyl chloride because because it is so bad smelling. Okay. Um, Pyridine also reacts with moisture. Also, um, you need to be ca careful with it. It has its own um, hazards and toxicities associated with it. So it's not something you want to just you know be throwing around. So wear wear gloves with it. Um, you want to make sure you handle it in the hood, keep it covered when you are transporting it to and, to and from the hood, and make sure you put it directly um, into your reaction. So because it reacts with moisture, don't um, don't like dispense of it and then let it sit for a while, and then then take care of it, putting it in your reaction. You want to have it go in your flask right away when you after you dispense it. So make sure you get your purity when you're ready ready to use it. Okay. Um, impurity and you do have to be careful with um, it um, can cause short term um, male ster sterility so you don't want to get it on you you don't want to spill it on you okay so handle it carefully handle it with gloves make sure that you use it in in the hood carefully okay um, so we have it, with this reaction, there's going to be some math that you also have to do, okay? Because everybody has different amounts now of their product A's, and now your product A all have different molecular weights, right? Because they either have a methyl propyl or methyl ethyl or propyl group on there, okay? Um, so I'm going to talk to you. There's some math that you're going to have to go through to figuring out how much acid chloride and how much of the pyridine you're going to be using for each of your reactions as well, all right? Um, so in the lab manual, it tells you you want to use one and a half to two grams, I'm going to turn this off here for a little bit, um, one and a half to two grams of your product A, of your 20 um, A product, okay? Um, so you want to make sure that you have that amount. If you don't have 1.5 to 2 grams, you're probably going to have to work something out with the other people that in, are in your lab that did the same, made the same thing as you, to be able to borrow a little bit of theirs. All right. Um, the other thing that you need is about 0.1 gram of that product A for TLC, and I'll talk, talk about using that here in a little bit. So you want to make sure you set aside just a little bit of your um, A product for TLC as well, okay? 
Um, now the first one that you're going to have to do some calculations for is the purity. And we tell you in the lab manual that you need 1.7 equivalents of purity. So what does that mean? Okay. This is based off of your 20A product. So the first thing you have to know is you have to know how much you are using to be able to do these calculations. All right. So you have to know how much 20A you are starting with. All right. You're going to take your moles of 20A product, okay? How much you are using. And what 1.7 equivalents means is it's 1.7 times the number of moles of 20A product, okay? So you're going to multiply this by 1.7. That is going to give you your moles of purity. Then you have to take that moles of purity and go from your moles to grams of purity. But purity is a liquid, we need, so then we need to go to volume is how much you need finally of your purity to know how much you are adding to your reaction. All right? So let me go, I'll go through this one more time. We need 1.7 equivalents of purity. We need to know the number of moles of our 20A product, okay? We're going to multiply the number of moles of our 20A product times 1.7. That gives us the moles of purity, okay? Everyone good, good with that point, okay? And then take your moles, go to grams. That should be fairly easy, but don't stop at grams. Go on to the volume of purity, all right? So in your round bottom flask, and I can't laugh when I draw things because I'm not very good at drawing. But we'll pretend that's a round bottom flask, all right? We're going to have, you'll have your 20A product in there, okay? And then you'll have the dry ether in there, and you want to try and get your um, A product as dissolved as possible in that ether. Um, sometimes it doesn't doesn't go completely, but get it get it as dissolved as possible. Okay, so stir it for a little bit. You're going to get a septum, okay, and this is kind of it's hard to draw exactly what a septum is, so we'll show you in lab this week. But basically that's how we're going to cover our reaction, okay, is with a septum. The reason we're using a septum is because we need to use a syringe for the acid chloride. And so that is, instead of putting a glass stopper on top, which we can't get a syringe through the septum, we can get the syringe through um, to add your acid chloride to your, to your reaction, okay? So you're going to get everything dissolved. You're going to get your pyridine in there, and hopefully that also keeps everything dissolved. We want to put our septum on top, okay? Then, we're going to have two needles involved, all right? So we have one needle that is purple. That is our vent needle. We're going to then have another needle that is connected to our syringe. That is a yellow needle. Um, that then goes with your syringe, okay? So that's going to be attached to your syringe, and then you'll, you'll have your syringe, all right? So we are going to put our acid chloride in, in the syringe, all right? So before we come, the TAs and, my, and your instructors are going to help you dispense of the acid chloride, all right? Before they come around with the acid chloride, you also have to know how much acid chloride you're going to use. So that's the other piece of our math. The acid chloride, we need 1.5 equivalents of that, okay? And so again, you're gonna take your moles, this is all based off of moles of 20A product that you are using, OK? 
okay? And multiply that times 1.5. That will be the moles of acid chloride you're using. And again, your goal of moles of acid chloride to grams to then volume, because we're adding it with a syringe, so that means we need volume to know how much acid chloride to use. Okay. So we're going to put um, we're going to, when we come around to get you the acid chloride, we will draw up how much acid chloride you need in that syringe. Yes? So are these calculations done in the form lab or is it after you measure out our chemical product? You need, you need to know how much you're working with so to make, make the appropriate one. So you, what you could do is ahead of time for know how much you need for one and a half grams and then once you weigh things out if that's different than what you're actually using um, then you need to adjust just the calculations. Yeah. If you have over two grams of the product do you want to use less than two? Yeah, you don't want to use more than two grams. It'll, when you get to doing the reaction it'll cause it not to stir very well. So you want, so you want to keep it in this, in this range. And like my students even, I'm going to tell them to only use one and a half grams. So listen to what your instructor tells okay. you. Um, just because sometimes the stirring can become really bad. So, so the more stuff you have in there, the harder it is to stir. Okay. We've got to use at least one and a half grams to have enough for heart C. Okay? Alright. So in, in the syringe is going to be your acid chloride. We are going to dispense the acid chloride, stick it into your septum. All right. Then you are going to add it dropwise, and this is where it also helps as far as stirring. Like you don't want to just sh shoot it all in there, because there's also some salts. We're going to talk about the mechanism here of what's going on. Um, there's also some salts in in there that are being formed, and they make this solid that makes it really hard to stir. You also want your reaction. You want your 28 product reacting with the acid chloride and not it just reacting with a bunch of other stuff in there as well, okay? So we're adding it into your reaction dropwise. Um, so you wanna make sure you're going to control the syringe so that everything gets in there dropwise, all right? And what part of what you make out of this, we'll go through the mechanism here, is you make HCl, so that is why we need the vent needle for that to vent vent out of it, all right? So here, here's what we're looking at. Your 20A product, whatever it is, okay, the hydroxy end of it, okay, is going to react with the acid chloride. So this is also called alcoholysis because the alcohol is going to react with that acid chloride and eventually we're going to get down to where we formed an ester with it, all right? Um, and so it reacts at the, the carbonyl carbon of your acid chloride, okay? Um, and then you get electron movement up to the oxygen of that carbonyl, all right? Now this looks different than last, we're not in acid, so we're not, we're not making things, even though it's called an acid chloride, we're not in acid itself. So we can form here, instead of positive like we had last week because we were in the presence of an acid on our oxygen here, we can have this negative here, okay? Um, so react at the carbonyl carbon, um, and we form this tetrahedral intermediate, okay? The chloride of the acid chloride is a good leaving group, right? So that guy will go pretty quickly, right? We'll get our electrons to kick back down, reform our carbonyl, we'll lose our acid chloride, okay? But in the process, we still have this positive charge here 
on um, what was the alcohol and now has added to the acid chloride. So we've got to get rid of that. That is where the pyridine comes in. Okay, so the pyridine reacts with that proton, all right? So neutralizes the species. And then what we end up with is um, this pyridinium, pyridine salt, pyridinium um, hydrochloride, okay? Um, in all this, you can potentially also just get HCl um, being generated if through this whole process. So that's why I was saying we need the vent on, on the acid chloride, okay? So in the end, in your reaction mixture, you're going to have your diester, but then you also have these salts. And depending on how thick those salts get, it makes it harder and harder to be able to stir things, okay? So that's why you want to, um, if you add things drop-wise, that will help um, and keep your stirring up, that will help to minimize the stirring issue that you have once these salt, salts are formed, okay? You're not going to prevent the salts from forming because they will form as a result of the reaction. What you want to do is keep the stirring going um, even in the presence of the salts. Um, now, after you've the addition, you are still then going to stir this in. Um, we don't want to reflux it, so if we wanted to reflux it, we would have stuck a condenser on top. We didn't do that, okay? We just want warm water bath. So typically, if you get really hot water out of the tap, that's going to be warm enough because remember your solvent is ethyl ether. It's not going to take much to boil it. We don't want to actually boil the solvent. We just want it warm and you're going to stir it for 15 minutes with a warm water bath around it to finish off the reaction, all right? If when, after you've added the acid chloride, you really have trouble stirring, okay, we can add more ether to it. But what you've got to do is remember now you've got that vent needle on top and you've got the syringe and needle on top of that septum. So you've got to very carefully pull things apart first, okay? So you're going to pull the syringe and needle out carefully pull the vent needle out carefully, then pull the septum off, put the put a five, 10 mils of ether in there, and then put the septum back on and um, the vent needle back on, okay? So you kind of want to, you still want to keep things as dry as possible, so you want to go quickly putting the ether in and getting the septum back on, but be careful taking needles out and then putting the needle back in again, not to get yourself, all right? Um, then after you're done with the stirring period, then we're going to pull all those things off anyway, okay? So you're gonna um, pull off the syringe and needle, pull off the vent needle, and then pull off the septum, all right, when you're ready to work things up, okay? Um, then there's multiple steps, just like we had last week, to the work up, all right? So the first thing that you're going to do is you need to add ethyl ether to it, okay? Um, and it is this at this point they're going to you're going to add um, get the right amount here. You're going to add um, ten mils. You're adding ethyl ether. This is 10 mils, okay? But now when we get to the workup, this is red can ether, all right? So we don't need to add anhydrous ether anymore because after you add this, you're going to add 10 mils of saturated sodium chloride solution, which is in water. So we're not going to worry about water anymore, all right? So this is the fir first step of the workup, all right? And you're going to um, add this, get everything as dissolved as possible, and then transfer it to your separatory file, okay? Um, this first step here is going to help you with removing some of those salts and getting the, some of those salts out of, out of your whole mixture, okay? So that's why we're starting with something aqueous and we're using sodium chloride. Um, to help if there's salt stuck in that ether layer to help pull those out because it's already salty, okay? 
Um, so you're washing with this 10 mils of saturated sodium chloride solution. So it's just like last week. You've got these two layers in your separatory funnel. Cap it, shake and vent, shake and vent, shake and vent. Uncap, let the layers separate. You're draining your aqueous layer. layer. Keep your organic layer in, in the separatory funnel, okay? You're, so here, this is our first wash. Our next one, we're adding one molar HCl, okay? And this one is to help get rid of the pyridine, okay? And so there, we used 1.7 equivalents. There will probably be some extra pyridine in there because they only, the reaction only occur, occurs in a one-to-one -one ratio. We just have the extra in there in case any of it gets you know, wet or anything like that, that you have plenty in there so you don't, don't run out for the reaction. Okay, so this um, HCl wash is to help get rid of the pyridine. So it's the same um, thing as far as wash, all the steps involved with wash, okay? You're going to end up in the end draining that um, aqueous layer. Yes? For the first wash, the lime manual says also 10 mils of water. Is that just... Oh, yeah. It's Sorry. Right? Yeah. Oh. Sorry. I forgot that part. There you go. So, yes. You're adding ether, you're adding the sodium chloride, and, and water in there. Okay? All right. So, second piece, we're adding... We've got our um, ether layer, and we're adding the HCl to it. Make sure you do a good job shaking and venting this, okay? Um, and then let your layer separate because we want to get all that pyridine out of there. If you don't get all the pyridine out of there in this step, we'll have to go back and do this wash again, all right? All right, third one is we're adding 10 mils of two molar sodium hydroxide. Now, why do you think we need the sodium hydroxide? We've already gotten rid of the extra pyridine. Any water we add is really going to take care of any acid chloride. Like, it's all, it's gone. Okay. So why would we add the sodium hydroxide? Basic. Basic. What, what would we, you know, we've got rid of pyridine, we got rid of the acid chloride. What else could we get rid of with base? Your starting material, right? Okay. You've got a nice phenol here, all right? Um, and so ba sodium hydroxide is basic enough. You will deprotonate your phenol and make that a salt that is then water-soluble, all right? So last week, when we did the sodium bicarbonate wash, we could have used so um, sodium hydroxide, but then we would have caused ourselves a problem with having your 28 product in there. We would have depronated here and made it um, aqueous, go into the aqueous layer instead of organic. So last week, that's why we only used um, sodium bicarbonate, all right, and not sodium hydroxide. This week, we want to get rid of this piece, sorry, this piece that has the phenol on it. We need a stronger base to do that, okay? So this will help get rid of your 20A product that might be still in there. So I'm going to say, get rid of starting material, but remember what starting material is in this case. That's your 20A product. Okay? Now the other thing with the base, and this can happen a little bit with the acid, but not as easily as, as the base. Um, the diester that we formed here, okay, one way to hydrolyze it, we're going to talk about enzymatic hydrolysis in a couple weeks, but another way to do this and take apart these esters is with sodium hydroxide and with basic ester hydrolysis. Um, so you don't want to put the base in there and let it just sit in there because you could actually end up taking apart your diester, all right? So you want to do this one pretty, like, do it well but do it quickly, okay? So you're gonna add the base to your organic layer, shake and vent three times, let the layers separate, and then make sure you pull that base off right away, okay? So you don't wanna add the base, shake and vent, 
let it hang out for five or ten minutes, and then come back and pull the base away. You want to you wanna pull that aqueous layer off pretty quickly, all right? But do make sure, like, you do actually shake and vent it. Don't, like, just add it, remove it, because that's not going to do the job you need it to do, all right? Um, and then the fourth one is you're going to do another... Um, saturated sodium chloride wash at the end, okay? And so you want to do these two pretty closely together too. So after you remove the base here, then you want to go and add the saturated sodium chloride, do that wash, because that will help get rid of any base that is left um, there and wash that away, all right? Um, now, at this point, okay, now you're going to TLC, all right, and you, your 28 product is your starting material, so you're making your own TLC standard. So instead of before, we'd have, you know, reactant standard and product standard for you to compare to your TLC, you have that because that's your 20A product, so that's where this setting aside 0.1 gram for TLC came from, you are going to have your 20A product and you want to dissolve it in ether. So remember, your product's a solid. You can't TLC a solid. You have to dissolve that in ether. And then you're going to also spot your ether layer on the same TLC plate. So you're going to end up with something like this where you have your A product, okay, and then this is going to be the B reaction, all right, the organic layer. What you are going to do then is spot it and develop this TLC. You are looking for is, re is all of the um, starting material out of your mixture, okay? If you run the TLC plate and you see, um, now is A going to be more polar or less polar than B? The hydroxy ester versus the diester. More. More polar, right? So what does that tell you about RF value? Lower RF value, right? Okay, so A should hopefully have a lower RF than B, right? So if you run, develop this TLC plate and in your B lane you don't see any more of A, you're good to go with um, drying this, your ether layer with magnesium sulfate, Rotovap, high vac, you're all set to go, okay? If you develop this and you still see A product over here with the B, then we need to get rid of it. And so what you will do is repeat three and four again, okay? Do these two washes again, and then do, the TL do another TLC plate. Make another TLC plate and develop it, right? Occasionally, instead of seeing a in there, we may see signs of pyridine. So it may be that your instructor says, don't worry about the base wash, worry about A, do another HCL wash, okay? Or sorry, not worry about A. Worry about number two, do another HCL wash, and then do a sodium chloride wash, and then do the TLC, okay? But if you have any questions about what is going on in this, this lane of your TLC plate, if you're not just seeing diester, Talk to your TA and your instructor to make sure you know what you need to do with your product, all right? And then after second TLC, if you end up having to do more washes, do a second TLC, show it to your instructor and they'll make sure everything's good to go to keep going, okay? So after these steps of our workup, for everybody, once you are, you've got a good TLC plate, you're gonna dry with magnesium sulfate, You're going to wrote about. So drying with magnesium sulfate also means filtering off the magnesium sulfate, right? Um, and then you use the high back pump. To get a good yield, what do you need to remember before you wrote about? Tear your round bottom flask before you wrote about so it's easy to get a nice yield. Um, and then um, your rotavap and use the high vacuum pump and then after that be able to get your yield. For butyl chloride people, because of the smell that's potentially involved, when you rotavap, 
Use one that's in a hood. Don't use one that's not in a hood. Okay, so we have two possible rotavaps to use. Use one of them that's in a hood. All right, um, or two two possible ones in a in a hood. So use one that is in a hood. Um, for the high vacuum pump for butyl chloride people, use the one that's in 3129. It's just a little bit more power to get get as much off as possible. Okay. Um, Acyl chloride and propanyl chloride, just use whatever rotavaps available, use whatever vacuum pump, pump is available, okay? All right, so questions, yeah? For the yield for 20B, do you want us to use the actual yield of 20A or theoretical So you have to calculate your theoretical yield based on how much 20A you use. Mm -hmm. use. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So then, pieces that you need to gather for, for your product are, one, you're going to have yield, two, you're going to have, you're going to prepare an NMR sample, okay, just like we have them, basically, everything this semester we analyze with NMR, and then the last piece will be collect an IR spectrum. So those are the three pieces you need. Yield, IR sample, or yield, NMR, sample, IR spectrum. Okay. All right. Now, the cleanup gets a little bit trickier because of the difference with the um, acid chlorides, okay? So the first one I'm going to go through is acetyl and propanyl chloride. What are you going to do to clean things up? First thing you want to do is rinse everything, glassware, needles, septa, syringes, rinse everything with acetone. Where does that acetone go? Into organic waste, okay? Okay? Um, then, with your syringe, syringes, needles, and septa, you're going to rinse with water. Okay, and then you'll rinse again with acid. You're going to return these pieces back, and we're going to reuse them for the other section. So you want to make sure you do a good job cleaning them. Okay, so rinse everything with acetone into organic waste. Rinse um, your septa and needles um, and syringes with water, and then rinse again with acetone. And then the, in the hoods is a place for used acetyl, propanyl, septa, needles, for, like there's beakers for each of these things, okay? Or there's a bin for the syringes. So you want to return them to the used pieces place, okay? Um, and just make sure you read the labels correctly to get them to the right, right bin. Um, the syringes, pull them out so that they can dry out, okay? So pull the plunger out and just leave it, okay? Don't leave the needles connected. We're going to, there's a separate place for the needles to go, right? Okay, and then everything else you can, um, you know, wash with, you know, clean like normal. Wash with soap and water, and then do an acetone rinse. Okay, butyl chloride, a little bit different. We got to get rid of that smell. And so you are going to rinse everything with acetone. And this eventually is going to go into a butyl chloride waste container. It's an acetone waste container. Okay? So we're going to keep it separate from the organic waste container so we don't make all the organic waste containers really stinky. All right? um, then the next thing you're going to do is rinse everything with bleach. And that includes septa, needles, syringes, okay? Um, you're gonna, and this is just like regular household bleach, okay? But the bleach kills the smell on the butyl chloride, okay? So that's why you're rinsing everything with bleach, right? Um, and then you're going to rinse with water. 
And then for your septa and needles and sur syringes, you're going to rinse with acetone. And that can just go into regular organic waste, okay? For the things you need to clean with soap and water, you'll clean with soap and water and rinse and then do rinse with acetone, okay? And this final acetone, now we've killed the smell of the butyl chloride, that can go into the organic waste, okay? Butyl chloride people will also give you a garbage bag that you will have in your hood and all, anything that comes in contact, so gloves, paper towels, anything like that is going to go in that garbage so that we don't have it out in the, the out area, other, outside the hood areas of the lab, okay? So make sure all that garbage goes, goes in um, those garbage bags. The other people in the lab that have stinky garbage stick it in their garbage bags so that we keep that out of the outside of the hood garbages as well, right? Um, now usually the people that have butyl chloride know how bad it smells and they are especially careful with it and I never smell any of it. It's the people that have the acetyl and propanyl chloride get a little more careless and those are usually the ones that I smell, okay? So, butyl chloride, I'm completely confident you'll be very careful with it. You won't ever smell it at all, okay? So if you go through all these procedures, no one will ever smell it except for the people dispensing it, okay? Um, but be really careful with, with the smells and then be really careful with cleaning things and getting them into the appropriate places at the end, okay? All right, questions with any of that? Okay, let's go through, we're going to look at your, um, the report form you're turning in, and then I've got a couple other pieces to give you, okay? So report form, very similar to 20A, you'll fill out your information about your product, draw your structure, um, you're going to compare your um, IR to the starting material, what's your starting material? Your 20A product, so what are you comparing it to? 20A IR spectrum, right? Okay, so you have all the information now because you it's your product, okay? Um, and then you'll assign the peaks, you'll make an IR table just like you did for 20A. Um, NMR, um, also you're going to analyze it just like you did for 20A, um, make an NMR table, draw the structure on your um, spectrum. Make sure that you label any peaks that don't correspond to your product as well as the peaks that do. Um, now you've gone two steps with this product, so there may be multiple extra impurity things in there that you have to make sure that you account for, okay? So, you know, if there's, if there's a little bit of 20A product left, if there's ether left, is there possible remnants of the acid chloride or the corresponding acid of the acid chlorides. All those things you'll have to account for in your NMR spectrum, okay? Then answer the questions, what else is there? Um, what evidence do you have that you made your product? What are the extra peaks? And then there is a backside to this report. So there wasn't for 28, for 20B there is. You'll put the information for your TLC plate and the RF values for your TLC plate. If you have to collect multiple TLC plates because you had to do multiple rounds and washes, put your final TLC plate on there, okay? And then, is there any reason not to continue? Yeah. So for like the IR spectrum, like we'll have to probably, I guess, staple like the starting material and the new product one onto the report. See what your instructor wants. Um, a lot of those are pretty similar, so see, see what they want you to do. If they want you to add that to it or just keep them separate, but in your table, make the comparisons. If you had a lot of impurities or you don't really see the product in there or anything questionable like that, because you want things fairly pure for going in without hydrolysis reaction. Yeah. All right, so things like your acid chlorides to know what those look like as far as what the corresponding acids look like, you'll have to use something like SCBS as a reference for what is the NMR spectrum going to look like. Okay, that
that's not going to be something that's in the solvent and purity table that you have. All right? Okay. I have posted this on Moodle, so you don't have to copy everything down now. But this is the names for all of the compounds that are made in 20A and 20B. So this is 20A, the three possible products, 20B, the three possible products, okay? So you've got your acid R, so meaning the first step, and your acyl R coming from, from the second step, okay, for, for 20B. And then for 20A, it was just the three, three possibilities, okay? So this is posted on Moodle. You don't have to copy this down, but you probably want to use this in your report form in, in, in your notebook, okay? One more piece to help you out. Here is the information if you haven't already done your pre-lab for this week for 20 days. Here is the information for each of the acid chlorides and, and for purity. I'm going to help you out with that one. Okay? Alright, and then once you have that information, you are free to 